we're doing the thing today because I apparently have no ability to be professional anymore at all. I'm just done. <laughs> I mean, who wants to be anyway? It's got right. It's got a little tired that layer of the tarot community. Yeah, it really has. And like I did that for years with like my regular job. I'm like I don't want to be professional anymore. Like I just want to goof off and play video games and chat with people about tarot. That's where I'm at right now. <laughs> be just yeah, be a freaking human. Yeah, be a human, absolutely. So, so I'm not going to do a weird intro because it's just that's just a weird thing. We're just going to jump right in because okay, I cool. think intros are weird anyway. Like, hello, this is me, and here's yeah. Tegan. Y'all know Tegan, right? <laughs> <laughs> Cosmic Creepers too. How did you come up with that name? Like, we we are going to talk about tarot stuff, but I'm just curious. So, Cosmic Creeper is uh, not. I can't take credit for it at all because it's not original. So, Cosmic Creepers is the mm -hmm. name of the cat in Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. So. Yeah. Dis it's Disney bed knobs and broomsticks, isn't it? I, I feel think so. Yeah, I, I think know. it's Disney. Like, yeah. Obviously, she's she's like one of the OG witches. I feel, and I remember mm -hmm. watching it. I loved all the sing song music. I thought she was really cool because for some reason I idolise people who are I don't know a little bit <laughs> a little bit stiff and uppity. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, That's awesome. I I just liked that she didn't take any shit. She was kind of, it mm -hmm. felt like a really interesting mix of magic and mundane, even from a mm -hmm. young age. And then she gets this gorgeous black cat that comes with all the witchy stuff. And the kids ask her, what's its name? And she's like, Cosmic Creepers. And I'm sure it's them that ask why. And she's like, well, it's the name that came with the cat. So I just kept it. Right. It's literally from that. I thought it would be funny because I figured people who knew would be like, mm -hmm. ah, because it's a big yeah. And mm -hmm. the reason I couldn't have Cosmic Creepers is because some other people, uh, I think they were like cat accounts on Instagram, right. already had it. And mm -hmm. I thought it would be funny to make it uh, split because whilst Cosmic otherwise isn't a word that I would – align myself with it doesn't really mm -hmm. fit my brand of right I, I wouldn't even say spirituality but like that kind of stuff mm -hmm. the fact that it's like a cosmic creeper like someone creeping in the background introvert mm -hmm. so I kind of I, I liked it I thought it was I never thought about it as creepy though until someone said recently a lot of your friends shorten it to creeper and it sounds strange and I was like <laughs> does it <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't to me, but <laughs> I think I'm 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 used to it though. I've been watching your channel since well before I started my own. So oh, really? like, yeah, I've been a fan for like ever. Like, let me fangirl for a moment here. Like, I'm in your Patreon and like all the things. I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but it's it's cool. I like it. I I don't think it's creepy at all. Maybe they're creepy. I'm just saying. Maybe they're creepy for thinking it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I yeah I thought it was fun and I figured it would stick and it took me a really long time to tell people my first name because I've always been quite anxious when it comes to being public online mm -hmm. just full stop mm -hmm. not just because of my job but just in general you know being public online is kind of weird right so it's weird it's totally weird yeah you get like there's like parasocial relationships that happen and stuff that's just really interesting. Yeah. And I always felt like my name was I know there's a couple of Tegans that I've I've sort of heard of since being in the tarot community, but for mm -hmm. the most part it's quite a still quite a unique name. And mm -hmm. I knew as soon as I put it out there that it would be more of a memorable one. <laughs> so Right. I was really I didn't show my face for ages on anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a whole thing. So I felt like Cosmic yeah. Creeper was one that it was kind of like, I don't actually have any tattoos, but I thought it, it would work as like a first tattoo in terms of a first name. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't grow out of it. It would always mean right. something to me. That's awesome because I totally grew out of mine because mine was a, like a, a joke because I didn't think I'd still be here five years later. <laughs> and then it stuck. And then I was like, oh, man, I'm still here. And I have to like rebrand. That's crazy. 
I totally get the rebranding though, because it was funny because for a while, at first you didn't show your face either. Right? I didn't know. Yeah. And so whilst there were hints that if you like paid attention when you first started making your stuff, mm-hmm. there were still hints to other things that you were into. So mm-hmm. the boho always intrigued me, but because you were so creative I just assumed that you did like a lot of crafts that might fall into like boho stuff. Mm -hmm. And I use that term loosely because I know very few crafts, but like, I don't know, macrame and whatever. No freaking clue how to do any of that. (laughs) And I was like, it must be that. And then time went on and you rebranded and then I started seeing like your T-shirts and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm like any issue with boho like a lot of people that I yeah grew up with and stuff that was more their thing you know boho mm-hmm. but I've always mm-hmm. been more like you like gamer nerd gothy yeah. grungy so yeah it was interesting because I was like well when I first started I just wanted to make a pretty video because that like I have background in that and I'm like oh I do this all day long for clients like I just want to see if I can make a super pretty tarot walkthrough. That was all it was, and then here we are. But I like that was a great aesthetic to work with, and yeah. so it was. It worked, and it works really well with tarot because it's fairly neutral. So no matter what deck I threw at it, so I'm looking was looking at it through my designer brain too, going, "That's a great aesthetic that encompasses all of these different things, and it's not going to compete with anything that I'm showing because I always want the mm-hmm. decks to be front and foremost." And so I was coming at it at that point from my marketing brain, from my designer brain. And since then, that's like gone out the window. And I'm like, okay, so the real me, totally like gamer nerd um, and all the things, like just so y'all know. But I didn't like I didn't really intend to be a channel. It just like, did you set out to to like be Tegan of Cosmic Creeper? Like I didn't set out to be this thing. <laughs> No, I'm a, I'm a bit of a weird one because I was like trying to hide in plain sight, which is always an interesting concept anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, when I started my Patreon way later, then the I suppose the intentions mildly changed because like mm-hmm. you want people to be on your Patreon. Otherwise right. Point. But no, I definitely didn't set out. My first video, though, was absolutely tragic. My first video was some really cheap free music with just me flicking through the cards with no Mm -hmm. voice whatsoever but the reason I came onto YouTube was mainly because I was so excited about the sort of they weren't really called VRs back then it wasn't as much Mm -hmm. I don't feel like it was sort of an unspoken thing you just responded to right you just responded Mm -hmm. But I was really excited to be involved in that. And what I noticed was people were more likely to talk to you and have you involved in the conversation if you were on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Instagram stuff, although the same people crossed over, it felt like a different crowd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to come on and play with Dex and be involved. Mm -hmm. Whereas on my Instagram, I was reading and really like trying to train my, at the time, Ride Away Smith brain. So Mm -hmm. it was, yeah, a completely just a playful, I'm going to come on YouTube and do whatever takes my fancy. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You make beautiful videos though. Like your aesthetic is like, that's like my fantasy self. Oh, really? I totally have fantasy self. Every time I see your any of your videos, your Patreon, anything, I'm like, I so want to do that. I want to be Tegan when I grow up. Like that's my <laughs> thing. <laughs> oh, I don't. But think that's I like there's but... <laughs> they're so beautiful. They're so beautiful. You make beautiful videos. Like okay. you and you have a very set aesthetic. Is that like is that something that you did, or is that just a natural part of your practice? No, see, that's the interesting thing. And I think that's why, I, I mean, I know that we are both very, um, I don't want to speak for you, but I feel like protective of aesthetics because I feel like mm-hmm. they're made reductive and minimized by a lot mm-hmm. of people when they're, yeah. they're they're powerful for so many reasons. But mm-hmm. mine's definitely just an extension of myself. Like my mm-hmm. whole space looks exactly like that in this mm-hmm. in this one room, like the rest mm-hmm. of the is uh we, we rent and it's a, a newer place so it's it's not mm-hmm. really how I want it to look but yeah this is just mm-hmm. 
how I live and breathe this Mm -hmm. is what it would look like even if I completely disappeared off YouTube and Instagram and the the one way that you can tell that is because I didn't have um as much of the the stuff that I have now but also Mm -hmm. I I had more I was sort of feeling into who I was aesthetically as a person at the time that I jumped Mm -hmm. onto YouTube I think so I came I came to my aesthetic quite late in life Mm -hmm. Um, and if you watch my newer you my older YouTube videos you can tell Mm -hmm. the aesthetic doesn't seem to quite align with me because I'm just working Mm -hmm. with what I have in my house and slowly Mm -hmm. it changes and it gets better so right yeah. yeah it's definitely just an extension of who I am. I do enjoy Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. setup because it's, I studied art before I studied anything else. Like I was Mm -hmm. always really into it. So I like it to look pleasing, but it's Mm -hmm. more for me than like Mm simply than for anyone else because I do get the occasional complaint about my setup as well, ironically. (laughs) We, we all do. I get complaints about mine too. Or really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Pick apart. You can pick apart anybody's video if you really want to be shitty about it. I'm just saying. Like you really can. See, yeah. I always thought that yours were just overall goals because you came on and you had this really crisp setup. When I don't feel like really anyone else had got their top most, down setup. Done. Yeah, most people don't because, and I always say I cheated. So I came into this already doing this for a living. So I already had all the equipment. I already had all the programs. And so like, I'm, I always want to be really clear about that for anybody who is like wanting to start a channel, like don't look at mine and go, that's where you start. Because I, I totally cheated. I came into this. I knew how to edit videos, like all of that. But it's interesting with the aesthetics because like, this is how it looks even when no one else is around. And for me, aesthetics is, it's just an expression of my personality. It reflects my mood. So yeah. My so, aesthetic will reflect my mood. Like, yeah, I get that. It's like, um, I like to think of it as expansive. I once said mm-hmm. to my partner, because people ask these weird questions all the time, like, if you could do mm-hmm. your house however you wanted or if you won money. Right. And I was like, oh, my perfect house, I said, would have like a gothic downstairs and then like a warmer, witchy cottage court upstairs. Mm-hmm. And like what and I said yeah oh, like, I totally get it <laughs> in and it's like vampire cathedral cold mm-hmm. dark I said because you can eat in that that's cool like have a kitchen like yeah. that even a sitting space but then you want to go somewhere warm and cozy and, and that's cozy. basically my two aesthetics split in half uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. yep so, I totally get that right vampire dungeon Yes. <laughs> I love it. That's I would totally live in that house. That's amazing. Yeah. I like the vampire thing. Mine would be vampire slash gamer. Yeah. Like I would oh, need a game. We would, ha- we would have a gamer room as like, well. Like absolutely gaming room. But yeah. But then I, I also love the like cozy aesthetic because like I think I posted stuff. I think it was just on my, my um stories on Instagram, but I was like, yeah, I'm always like murdering things in games, but also like I play these cozy little games where I'm like, oh, let's go help the little cute bear out, you know? <laughs> like, so the two opposite ends of my spectrum there. Yeah. Like I want to murder everything, but then I also want to help all the cute little forest animals find their lost letters. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel yeah. like th- that if people were more comfortable living in their quote unquote contradictions because to me mm-hmm. that's just part of being a human mm-hmm. then it would all just be really peaceful because yeah but I definitely feel like we came from eras where it was like what what genre is your music what genre mm-hmm. is the way you dress and I used to remember mm-hmm. feeling really sort of uh thrown by that because I could never pick one in the first mm-hmm. place and so yeah. I spent like my whole entire growing up being like I was a grunger then I was a punk then I was a goth mm-hmm. then I was a chav like I just did mm-hmm. the whole lot. same <laughs> same yeah like, desperately yeah. trying to find one only to realize mm-hmm. I'm I'm just a mongrel <laughs> uh-huh. same totally a mutt I'm just a little bit of everything yeah <laughs> it I mean it's it's human and especially when you're looking at like social media you're only seeing one aspect and you're only seeing the aspect that the person you're following is allowing you to see 
Yeah. And so like you have to keep that in mind because there's only you're only seeing the small portion of their their aesthetic in a sense, their their way of being in the world. And so and, and like when you're taking at like channels that do specific thing, very niche channels like, you know, we have where it's like tarot or witchery or, you know, something fairly focused. But we are complex beings. We have many facets to us. We have many interests like yeah. We're people. <laughs> We're people. Like, and we have feelings. And when you leave us mean comments, it hurts our feelings. <laughs> like, oh, it's, I was yeah. literally talking to someone about this the other day, and I said, I said, you know how often people say to me, "Oh, just brush it off," or "Oh, it's just part and," and I'm like, it is part and parcel. It and is. to a point, yes, you do have to really be good at getting a thick mm -hmm. skin if you're going to stick around. Mm -hmm. I said, but also mm -hmm. absolutely. Ways, you're just allowed to be having a bad day because mm -hmm. you're hormonal or you're grieving or you're in pain mm -hmm. or you've lost your job or mm -hmm. I don't know, woke up on the wrong side of the bed and some mm -hmm. twit comes into your space and gives you abuse. And it's the day, it's the day that it breaks the camel's back. Yep. Every time. Yep. They yeah. Just, yeah. It's a, it's a weird experience. And I think mm -hmm. for, such niche channels like you said it's quite I feel like it's quite intense sometimes because it's not balanced out by such an exacerbated fan base that mm -hmm. some other people might get so yeah it's like on any given day I have I have quite a low comment rate on YouTube anyway I don't know mm -hmm. if I scare people I don't know what's going mm -hmm. on but it's just a low comment rate and mm -hmm. so when I think about it like that I'm like okay four supportive comments one abusive comment it the weight of it is uh is, is not mm -hmm. great for a bad mum. it's it's not great yeah there's there's also I think the whole thing of we know we have a small community so mm -hmm. I feel like when there is a, a personal attack in that happens in a comment, it does feel very personal because you know we're such a small community. And it's not, you know, we're not dealing with millions of people, millions of viewers. Like, yeah. you know, people will tell me, like, you have a huge YouTube channel. No, I don't. I have a very small, if you're looking at YouTube it's on a grand scale, tarot, but it's, it's huge for tarot, but it's very, very small for YouTube in general. <laughs> gamer youtubes are the numbers are insane so oh yeah that's how i sort of when people go oh, this person's youtube's really big and i'm like yep for us it's very big for yes. the rest of the world it's very small it's very teeny tiny like we're over here just in our hiding in our little corner just having our little chats um i'm totally okay with that i don't need to interact with the rest of the world it's fine no it's <laughs> it's rather large but it does make me laugh when people say oh how do you feel that tarot is getting so much bigger and so much mainstream and i'm like is it though because i get i, I i'm very fortunate i live in a country where i'm not you know, at risk of getting beaten or stoned or anything horrific mm -hmm. for it. At the same time, aside from seeing it in a few quote unquote trendy shops like Urban mm -hmm. Outfitters and mm -hmm. TK Maxx, which is obviously TJ Maxx, you're in. Right. It's not, no one talks to me about tarot. I still go out into the world. And if I was to mention it to anyone outside of my family, the the chances are they would probably still think I was an odd bod. Like, mm -hmm. it's, Absolutely. Yeah. It's not as it's not anywhere as big as I feel like sometimes people feel like it is. Mm -hmm. I feel like the increase in deck production that we've seen over the last like five years or so gives that illusion. There's a lot more decks than there used to be. Oh my God. A lot that? more decks, <laughs> like a lot more decks than there used to be. And so I think that gives the illusion that the community is growing bigger than it actually is. But there's also different sides of the tarot community. We have like our side over here, but then there's the other side where it's like all the pick a card readers. They do have big channels. Some of them have millions of followers. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It's surreal because I don't feel like the two communities cross over very much. They I, really don't very often. I don't watch them. <laughs> I, don't I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. It's, it's like, really, it's not for me. <laughs> yeah. It's not for me either. It's not, it's not, not my thing. I, I like our side of things where we all talk about like what we're actually doing with our decks and yeah. our practices and things like that. Yeah, very much the same. I like the intimacy. I don't like mm -hmm. I've had a couple of friends who do like 
who are in our community who then might do a random card reading or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I do find the the particular genre and approach of those big ones really um, mm -hmm. rub a discomfort in me about reading styles. So, yes. Yeah, definitely. same. Not my thing. <laughs> Not mine either. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm good on our side of tarot tube. For sure. We can be a big fish in a little bitty pond. That's totally cool. I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> I, I, it's funny because I... I know I've been around for a while, but I still feel really small, like, and un, not uninsignificant in, like, a poor me way, but I definitely I definitely feel like a, a outskirter, or I, I can't think of a quite a right word for it, but I feel like I sort of met, like, a middle range and then mm -hmm. just stayed there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, growth on YouTube is hard, but I feel like everybody knows who you are. Like everybody I know knows who you are. So <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 so strange to me because I don't actually I, I think it's more how we perceive things in terms of the only way I've ever been able to sort of gauge stuff, and I don't know whether it's where like I, I struggle to pick up on some of those more subtle keys anyway, like mm -hmm. just the way I'm wired. So I always just associate it with like actual engagement. And I'm not talking about likes mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but more mm -hmm. commentary. Yeah. Conversation. So it's yeah. And it's always mm -hmm. been quite low for me. Um, mm -hmm. Predominantly most of my existence, I did get quite a bit on Instagram, perhaps in the early days, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, a, it's always a funny one because then people like yourself who I'm like, oh, like to me, you're famous <laughs> in the tarot. <laughs> See, to me, you're famous. So because like I was watching your channel way before I started mine. So which is hilarious to me because I'm like, <laughs> my partner says, who are you going on with? And I'm like, Dawn, I'm like, she's fucking big. On, I'm going, this is my hair look OK, because she's she's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, it must be a perception thing, but also for me, it, it might be that. But I I I just I perhaps I'm just not as approachable as some other people I can't really work out why um mm -hmm. but I know that sometimes I'm quite serious although I feel like I giggle a lot so mm -hmm. it's just a it, it's just an interesting one to me but yeah I it always surprises me when people say oh yeah loads of people know who you are and I'm like really mm -hmm. who are these people really? yeah I, I see that too I'm like wait what do you mean it's a weird thing being on YouTube. It's it's a really weird thing. It is. And it, I would imagine it's even weirder for you because you show your face so much. Like, I've only just started doing it. I mean, I did mm. one because all of my face stuff has been on other people's channels. So I only have mm -hmm. one online and I, I did a live with Tamara. And the thing is, the live's like two hours long because mm -hmm. we can't shut up. So it didn't. Yeah obviously get the same level of footfall that a nice mm -hmm. minute video would mm -hmm. but uh, yeah I just don't seem I just don't feel up to it on my own so it's yeah. uh, I imagine it's it's weirder for you because obviously people become more more familiar with you when they see you mm -hmm. feel. yeah they do I mean humans were <clears throat> like hardwired to respond to faces so yeah. like being here and showing my face here is this I think because it was such a slow transition for me, that I slowly started coming on camera more. And, you know, part of that was because I was working in a sort of adjacent industry at the time. And I just wanted to keep the two things separate. So I'm like, I just won't show who I am. And the weirder thing has been doing the gaming stuff because that's a whole nother side. And that has freaked people out because they're like, wow, you and Lisa are insane. We're like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we unwind. Yeah. But. I like that though. I'm all for letting your freak flag fly. Like mm -hmm. I, I feel like the, the niche community can sometimes stifle us. And I don't even feel mm -hmm. like it's a personal option because for me, mm -hmm. I know that it's almost reinforced by a lack of engagement and that lack of mm -hmm. engagement. It's not that I, I think people sometimes misunderstand it as like, Oh, well, you're only here for numbers and stuff. And it's like, no, but also 
um, and I know that you have at least some health stuff going on yourself. Mm-hmm. As someone who's disabled and energy is like properly a currency with me, mm-hmm. there's literally no point in me showing up on YouTube in a way mm-hmm. where I'm not going to get to have a conversation with anyone mm-hmm. because it's such a waste of energy. So yeah. I definitely feel like that that sort of, it's like a co-creative thing and that's how we mm-hmm. get niched in. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, it's a lot of work to come in and do all of this and, and to not, to not get any sort of engagement. And like I said, it's not about the numbers. It's about the making connections with people. And because for most of us, we don't have people in our, I hate the term real life, but in our physical space that we can, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, within touching space, with that we can geek out about about this kind of stuff. And so yeah. when we find this community and we're like, I want to come on here and have a conversation with whoever. So it's like the please comment, please like let's engage in conversation, like let's talk about it. That's why we come on and, and do yeah. these things. It's not like for for most channels, I think that I watch. It's they're not trying to sell something. They're not even if they have like a membership, even if they have books or decks or whatever, they're like most of them. They're not really trying to sell you anything. They're just trying to share this thing that they love and trying to find other people who want to talk with them, too, about this thing that they love. And it's amazing when we all click and connect and find each other. And it's great. But I I think there is this perceived it's it's about the numbers. It's not. It's about people. It really is, because. I think most people would say less views, more comments, because it's something like you said, to to get into. And I think that's why more and more people have probably gravitated to Discord as well, because Mm -hmm. those little private servers tend to bring people outside of themselves a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also interesting too, when the comments will be really low and I'm like, Oh, what did I do? Like, what was wrong with that one? (laughs) Where did I fail? Yeah, I went wrong somewhere. I actually don't really, I don't really look at, I don't look at my analytics. Do you, do you look at yours? I have stopped looking at my analytics because years ago it used to really stress me out because I Mm -hmm. have, shout out to my hater, because I have someone who (laughs) literally, it was back when you could see dislikes as well, which you proved, didn't they? Years mm-hmm. and years ago, I got someone decide, and it could be someone new, it could just be coincidence, mm-hmm. but the first 24 hours, one of my video goes up, almost every time without fail, there's a dislike really quickly, and it's mm-hmm. just happened forever to the point of my brother going, someone's put a bot on there, and I'm like, look, I don't care. I used to, but I don't mm-hmm. anymore. Yeah. I was like, it's, but it's been years. Yeah. Um, so yeah I don't I don't bother with them the only yeah. reason I go on my analytics is to check is there a better time for me to post um mm-hmm. which usually ends up not being when I post because I don't have the thing ready and have mm-hmm. I missed any comments and that's mm-hmm. it. it's I think it's healthier speaking from years of experience of looking at stuff like that it's actually better not to like I don't have an mm-hmm. app on Instagram years ago mm-hmm. I had one that like told me who followed me who unfollowed me mm-hmm. who was a ghost follower and I don't have any of that crap anymore either yeah I I think I think those kind of things are really counterproductive to what we're trying to do in this space I couldn't tell you how many people I have on Instagram no freaking idea I never look at that because it doesn't matter because I would do the same thing I'm doing now whether it was 10,000 people or 10 because I like <laughs> I'm just sharing. I think that's the sweet spot as well. Like I've definitely gone through periods of time where I've had more insecurity and the mm-hmm. the friends at the time have known and I've kind of said like, have you got any feedback? Maybe there's something mm-hmm. that I could do differently. Mm-hmm. And it's like it never that never works anyway. And mm-hmm. I, even when I've tried, it's it's almost like I'm incapable. So the thing that I get told to do, I still do it in the way that I would have done it before. So mm-hmm. yeah. It's just, and I suppose that's why the aesthetics argument always, I suppose upset me a little as well in terms of feeling misunderstood because mm-hmm. I used to say to people like this is really me as mm-hmm. much as I'm a private person and I may not give people all of the areas of my life 
the bits mm-hmm. that I do show up for are very, very authentic. I lay out my cards all cute on my altar and don't take mm-hmm. pictures of them. It brings yeah. me deep, deep, deep joy. Some days yep. I cannot be bothered to take the picture. The lighting's wrong. My mood's mm-hmm. wrong. I still lay yeah. them out and I have herbs mm-hmm. everywhere. Well, and I look at it and I'm like, this is cute shit. <laughs> right? I do the same. Like, even when nobody's looking, it's like I've had people ask, Do your journals really look like that when you don't show them? Yeah, they've looked like that for years. That's just how I journal. Because to me, it's a whole part. Like, laying out an aesthetic, laying out a spread to look aesthetic is part of my practice. Yeah. The aesthetics is a part of the practice. That's just how I creatively and artistically express what it is that I'm trying to do with whatever I've got at hand. And it just like, I do the same shit, whether anybody's looking or not, like, cause it's for me first and foremost, it's for me. Exactly. And that's always how it was. Like, even when I was younger, we were, um, there were points when we were allowed to draw on our own walls and we would Mm -hmm. like draw. I mean, my sisters were always better at sort of free form drawing than I was, Mm -hmm. but, and things would be like drawn and painted on the walls by us. And it was like, that's just your artistic expression. You made it the Mm -hmm. house, made it where you lived. It just, it is. Yeah. So, To me, it's no different from someone enjoying dressing in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We just dress our space and our readings and everything else that we do. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I, the, the aesthetic thing gets me too. Like my favorite is when people are like, oh, you just want to make it look pretty. Yep. Absolutely. Why do you say that? Like, it's a bad thing. I absolutely want it to look pretty. (laughs) I mean, it's useful and like. Sometimes I throw pairings together that I'm like, oh, this does not look good, but they work. So yeah. like I will continue with it, but I'm like, yeah, absolutely. What's wrong with making it look pretty? It makes me happy. So what do you care what I do on my tarot table? Like <laughs> that's the thing, isn't it? It's like if if people are so worried about people being authentic, then really what that you would hope they would expand to the knowledge that if something's bringing someone joy, that is authentic. That is is authentic. That's yeah. a powerful thing in mm-hmm. a world where it's quite challenging to carve out joy sometimes. So yeah, yeah I'm all for it. And I think, yeah. I, I hope that it, those kind of narratives and conversations don't put off newbies because I think mm-hmm. they're quite heavy ones to come into and can mm-hmm. create panic that is is just insignificant in the grand scheme of things Mm -hmm. I think you you and I are both a good example of just doing your aesthetic regardless because it's a part of us and it's a part of our practice and how how we go about being in the world so like clearly you can make it work on YouTube you contrary to proper belief you can be authentic on YouTube (laughs) like it's a thing it can happen yeah definitely yeah. Is your, would you say your, your practice? So a lot of your practice is very animal centric. Is that, I'm asking you questions that I kind of already know the answer to, but like maybe not everybody else does. <laughs> is that always been, a, have you, has your practice always been pretty animal centric? Yeah. Cause you have like your animal gnosis that you do with your Patreon, which like is amazing. And I don't always post about it, but I, I read it every time and I do it. Yeah, I, I definitely I'm so I'm so elated that people enjoy it because mm-hmm. whilst I definitely didn't create working with animals and in the slightest humans have been mm-hmm. doing it across cultures for years mm-hmm. I do I feel like aside from a certain way of working with it which at the time when I came into the community I was very careful not to do because there was um there was layers of it that weren't culturally fitting for me Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But also it felt very divorced from animals in our, in our reality. So sort of like, Mm -hmm. like you said, in real life, it felt like it was just the, Oh, they're pretty symbols. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm so happy to hear that you enjoy it because that all every time someone says they enjoy it, I'm like, yay. But that's it, that's like the part I love about it because it is you don't just like we've got no shortage of information about this animal as a symbol. But mm-hmm. your practice talks about also real life because these are real life animals, these are real life energies that we can, you know, work with not only in terms of symbolically, but also like they literally exist in our world. And I think that's so cool. 
Yeah, I really, I like that. That's <clears throat> one of my passions, but it definitely, <clears throat> to answer your question, it's been a, always a part of my practice because it was the one part of my practice that existed before I had a practice. If that before you had a practice, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was born into a family of very animal orientated people, mainly because they were terrible with humans, but <laughs> <laughs> that's valid. It's totally valid. <laughs> so both the one thing that both of my parents shared other than myself, <laughs> their, their love of animals, but in very mm -hmm. different directions. And I think that's what helped encompass mine as well. Because my parents, mm -hmm. were they split when I was two. So I didn't really experience mm -hmm. them together. Mm -hmm. But my my mum and that side of things was always very like animal rescue, engaging with wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, she was the one that always taught me to like move roadkill for the various reasons and things like mm -hmm. that from a really young age. So it was quite um and obviously now like it has a name and it's all oh, it's death craft but back then it right. was the thing that you did that made you right. weird <laughs> mm -hmm. <Right. Because laughs> like uh, that's gross um, right but it was always a, a mark of respect but also a way to protect like any other animals including right. our cats because they were outdoor mm -hmm. cats and obviously dead bird in the road looks kind of tasty yeah um, so it was that was that side of things. Whereas my dad's like a walking encyclopedia, and mm -hmm. has always he's far more in, interested in insects and creepy crawlies and other stuff as well, which are far less popular. Right. And he loves facts and mm -hmm. documentaries and stuff like that. So he would always watch documentaries on TV, and he would talk to me about facts. And it was sort of a way where um, when I got like was able to get back in contact with him at a later date, that we were able to like share an interest. And I'm mm -hmm. quite um, where I'm. I'm neurologically diverse anyway. It's one of mm -hmm. my. It became like a hyper focus for me, a fixation. Mm -hmm way that I could relate and also through my childhood their animals were such a like a key part of that because mm -hmm. my childhood I will save you the intricacies of it but was chaotic and here there and everywhere and the mm -hmm. one certain thing was actually the animals in my life mm -hmm. so I think I became quite acutely aware of their presence and I received a lot from them as a youngster mm -hmm. And then I got to a certain age and realised I, I really want to give back because mm -hmm. they have literally been here for me. And I know consciously they don't have a freaking choice, but they're right. so unconditional in comparison mm -hmm. to humans that yeah. I really just wanted to start showing up for them. And I realised at a later date, oh, shit, this is sort of my witchcraft mm -hmm. in a big way. Um, and was also a big part of my card journey because the medicine cards were the first oracle deck I ever had and I I mm -hmm. had from like you know really 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 young so mm -hmm. yeah they are I have the I have the medicine woman because of you how many people have told you that <laughs> yeah it's like my Tegan has this deck I need this deck yeah <laughs> it's funny That's amazing. say to me now Oh, I've never heard of that deck. And I'm like, God, I'm getting old. Man. Uh, yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> that's a thing. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, it is from the 80s, so that mm -hmm. that kind of tracks. But yeah. yeah, I love that deck. I actually, mm -hmm. I was talking about that deck to someone, I think about two days ago in a tarot reading. Mm -hmm. and I mentioned it in passing and they said, what deck? And I said, it's a really interesting one because whilst it's imperfect, as most decks mm -hmm. are from the 80s mm -hmm. and 90s, and I'm Absolutely. sure it will be from now in 20 mm -hmm. years time, it's a lot more diverse than mm -hmm. um, other decks that were out at the time. And because at it the was time, my yeah. first deck, I didn't realise that decks were all white or all one way. Or mm -hmm. So it's, it's really interesting. I was quite fortunate that that was my first deck, I think, because I had a bit of mm -hmm. a different experience with it than mm -hmm. everybody else. 
Yeah. So you were similar to me. You had to learn the Rider Waite Smith after you learned tarot, right? Because I was the same way. I was like, what is this? (laughs) Did you know there was a system? Because I didn't. I I did well. I I knew there was a the system that I was taught is very basic numerological elemental. Yeah. So it applies to any deck. It doesn't matter what I'm working with. I can use it with anything because that's what I was taught. And then eventually I learned. Oh, there's this thing called the Golden Dawn, and oh, there's this thing called the Rider Waite Smith, and oh, there's this thought thing, and like, I'm like, oh, cool. But to me. Everything I do still underneath goes back. Like I can read with a Rider Waite Smith. Mm -hmm. And when I was learning Rider Waite Smith, I'm like, that doesn't add up. My brain hates the three of swords. It hates it. Usually the three and the 10 are the ones of swords that really, really mess with numerological people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Like three of swords is heartbreak. Somebody please explain to me why the three of swords is heartbreak. When in the intellect communication so yeah yeah it's some i mean i've had uh, and believe no i'm just kidding please don't explain it to me because i've had people give me whole dissertations on why the writer wait smith three of swords is proper i i like cool i get i get it like i really don't need anybody to so just saying that um just but my brain <laughs> yeah please please don't send me your paper on the three of swords like i i mean like, if you already have it written and you want me to look at it, cool, cool. But, like, do, don't write it. Um, like, I do, I do understand because I've studied the writer Wait Smith, but my brain still goes, that's not correct because yeah. that's not how I learned. And I learned this base structure that was basically would allow you to read with any deck in your own way. And now I go to, um, well, I'm not an 18th century Catholic mystic, so that system really doesn't work for me. Yeah. So I'm intrigued though. How did you learn the courts through that system? The courts through that system are basically like how each energy is embodied in a oh. personification level. So like the the page is like the kind of student. This is where you're learning. The knight is you're taking that and you're going out and doing something with it. The queen is you're nurturing it. And the king is kind of like, you've kind of mastered it at this point, but it's within their base element. So it's how you embody that energy. The same like I was also the sensible way. Cause yeah. I was taught like, you know, the, the, the different suits are like knowing, being, doing and feeling yeah. that's the, the, what they relate to. Because if you're looking at it and you're reading it from a, as, as a personal on a personal level, which is also how I was taught to read. I was not taught to read the people who taught me to read, did not read for others. So everything was framed within the 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 self-reflection focus. Like we're going to lay out this picture book and you're going to tell me what it's telling you. And that's the layer and how we're going to learn to to work with the cards. So that's how I was taught. Whereas I think a lot of people who learn out of books or they learn from tarot teachers, those mm-hmm. are people who read professionally. And I mean, like some of my best friends are professional tarot readers, but I think it's a different way of learning because I was taught by people who didn't like, maybe they knew the writer Wade Smith. I have no idea. Like they, or they chose to completely ignore it or this was cause it was like a family thing. Yeah. So it was like a, you know, grandmother taught mother taught aunt taught, you know, cousin taught whatever. And was taught to me by a friend. And well, that's, so. That's so cool though, because yours is still, um, it feels quite structurally, solid and reliable Mm -hmm. whereas the way that I was taught (laughs) tarot (laughs) was kind of chaotic so very very different and I I knew there was a system so much in the especially because of the way that I was introduced to the cults which is why I had such a problem with the cults because even as a kid I didn't like how I was introduced to them it Mm -hmm. didn't make sense to me and I am still yet to really align with what, where that came from in terms mm-hmm. of because not everyone from any of those systems does it now. But it's, it was that very, um, if they're the sword suit, they have very pale skin and dark hair mm-hmm. and they look a certain way. And, right. and then you start getting into problems like, okay, well, a lot of the cults were then white, so that's a problem. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, mm -hmm. You can only be uh, in the ones if you're a ginger. Uh, well, mm -hmm. loads of my family are ginger, so <laughs> <laughs> that actually works. <laughs> Um, like uh yeah and it was it never aligned and made sense to me and mm. the thing that didn't make sense was that there was like everyone seemed to be agreeing that was in and around me at the time on the calls but then I was taught to read the rest of the cards much more story intuitively and so it's mm -hmm. like I didn't I knew that there was a system in, I'd seen a couple of decks and they had similar names. Like mm -hmm. there was a strength, there was 78 cards. Mm -hmm. But as far as I was under the impression, people just read from what they were seeing mm -hmm. and their intuition. And if you were really, really stuck, which obviously I was really young when I started, mm -hmm. like pre-teens, I was looking through tarot decks, using tarot, right. playing with tarot decks, because I don't think it's fair to say I was sensibly reading before my teens. Right. Then I would fall back and look at the book. But the two books mm -hmm. that I had were the tiny white, like little insert for the medicine woman, right. tarot, which has about a sentence to two sentences per card and is mm -hmm. very very loose from Rider Waite Smith so right. far removed from it and then the mythic tarot which is of course mm -hmm. I feel like technically Rider Waite Smith but you had mm -hmm. the whole uh, psychotherapist psychological mm -hmm. cleansing in that and of course a lot of Greek myth and myth yeah and they were the two bits of information that I had if I was mm -hmm. to reference a book. So it was quite um, quite chaotic, but it was mostly just my mum read for herself and she was a journaler. Mm -hmm. She journaled her dreams. Mm -hmm. She journaled the animal mm -hmm. cards she pulled. She journaled the tarot readings. And it was mm -hmm. being like, pull a card, tell me what you see, tell me what you feel, tell right. me what this means to you pull another card what do they say to each other tell me what it means tell me what it feels mm -hmm. so um it was quite yeah intuitively visually done mm -hmm. except from the cult and so I never got them because they I would always rely on um not so much with the medicine woman tarot but when I had the mythic tarot I would rely on the guidebook for the cults because I just felt mm -hmm. disempowered by them and mm -hmm. then I think I spent a lot of time with Oracle, whereas my tarot was like on and off. And then mm -hmm. to you, it was like I hit a certain point. For me, it was about 2015 coming into blogging and stuff because I had a blog before mm -hmm. I entered um, Instagram world. And then like mm -hmm. it was not popular, but I had my own mm -hmm. blog. And yeah. I realised oh, there's this thing called Rider Waite Smith and uh -huh. it's apparently the way that you read tarot because that's how people yeah. are saying it at the moment. There was no mention of yeah. Smith, no mention mm -hmm. of numerology or Marseille. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, shit, like all these years that I thought I could read tarot, mm -hmm. I can't read tarot, which is a sad point to be at because I was convinced, like, oh, I can't read tarot, like I don't understand it. Yeah. Um, but I also taught myself Rider Waite Smith using <laughs> using the wild unknown tarot. Oh, perfect! I mean, <laughs> that's um, perfect. <laughs> stressful. It was a. Uh, uh, in the end, I got because I got a Rider Waite Smith, and I've honestly, I've always loathed it. I just mm -hmm. I can't get on with it. Doesn't represent anything familiar to me whatsoever mm -hmm. because it's not nostalgic because I didn't grow up seeing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're not my people, and it just mm -hmm. so removed from me. So in the end, mm -hmm. I got uh, what's it called? The uh, mystical cats tarot, I think it is, mm -hmm. or something like that. Just a Llewellyn deck, which is more right away Smith, and I mm -hmm. used that and yeah, the the wild unknown, and taught myself <laughs> taught myself right away Smith. That's awesome. Swiftly taught myself numerology after. Mm -hmm. which is is my preference but I can lean into the deck that I'm using to mm -hmm. a point I do think that my style confuses people who are very purist because mm -hmm. I do tend to 
fiddle with them especially ones like you're saying like the three of swords that's just Mm -hmm. I don't read it as heartbreak if it's got Mm -hmm. that in it then I will talk about the how our emotions have a have a relationship with our narrative of our brain and those two Mm -hmm. things interact with each other but it's not through that specific lens so Yeah. yeah I've ended up being quite a quite a mongrel in in that as well yeah I think that like I've kind of built over the years and I'm I'm guessing with you you've read tarot as, as long as longer than I have but for for many many years that you kind of I feel like you evolve into your own system in a sense like you create your own language with the cards and my language will change based on the context of the reading and I think that's the piece of the puzzle that we don't talk about near enough in yeah. in, in community conversations the context is so important to the interpretation of the card because one card can mean one thing one day and then something else totally different the next. Yeah. And I think that it's just not as black and white as when you're trying and and learning tarot is very, it's a, it's a big undertaking, especially if you're going to learn it based on a system, which is why I like the numerological elemental because like this is this and it's very broad. And then you use the art to, how do I create nuance in, in that moment? Because it changes based on what I'm what I'm reading about and the, the context. Like if I'm doing a deity reading versus a what do I need to know today? Those are two very <laughs> different energies. Yeah. Like so it's it's I don't think we talk about that near enough in in the the tarot com- community and in our conversations about how important that is. It's definitely missing. And I think that. I know one of the reasons, well, there's several reasons I don't talk about certain things. One of them is because um, when I'm really low energy, I I, I save the the meatiest offerings that I've got for Patreon because, of Mm -hmm. course, I feel... um, I feel uh, and not a horrible, but a nice obligation to the people Mm -hmm. who are paying me to service. Also, because I know that unfortunately time and time again when I'm not showing my face sometimes instead of putting the videos on in the background which would be a perfect opportunity to do that people find Mm -hmm. that they it's it's like oh it's not on a podcast server so there's no face I'm not going to engage right but I do feel like that's a massively missed nuance and then there's the discussion which I don't think happens as much but there are obviously people read differently and each to their own I'm not Mm -hmm. I'm not invested in how other people read in Mm -hmm. a in a in a way that has a negative impact on me unless they are telling me that I'm reading wrong right and you do find a few of those kind of purist mentalities where it's Mm -hmm. like well no a card is a card is a card a deck is Mm -hmm. the same the same the same and I'm like well Mm -hmm. if I felt like that firstly I'd only have one tarot deck Mm-hmm. To me, art is a whole language, but also I feel like we're in relationship with our reading. So we're mm-hmm. having a moment with that. But a great example and what you inspired me to think of when you were talking is that, yes, of course, it's different. Because if you pull three of swords, as we've been talking about it mm-hmm. in in a reading with, you know, like I'm having a really rough time. What's coming up for me? Three of swords. You're going to read it one way. If you pull mm-hmm. three of swords in what's a superpower of mine at the moment and you get the mm-hmm. three of swords I'm sure as hell hoping that someone reads it differently because otherwise right what uh, your superpowers being heartbroken also heartbroken yeah great yeah good day for me yeah. <laughs> so it's it is so much about the nuance and mm-hmm. I just can't work out if people are uncomfortable talking about it or it's again I find it easier in these sort of conversations Mm -hmm. because then you can you can have a back and forth about it Mm -hmm. I guess that's why when for that small period of time me Tamara and Joanna had that um tarot uh, what I can't even remember the name of our own channel now. Actual tarot podcast. Actual tarot. Yeah, I was gonna say actual and tarot. We were, yeah, we were reading cards together. I really mm-hmm. enjoyed that as a process because I feel like, firstly, you get more than one person's reading style, and so you get to talk mm-hmm. about it. But secondly, people saw it in action, and then mm-hmm. you can see how the deck that I choose 
ever so slightly changes the way that I interact mm -hmm. with those cards because some of them are more fluffy, some of them are more pippy, some of them are mm -hmm. more right away Smith. And whilst I have this integrative way of reading that, like yourself, it very much relies on a numerological elemental system, there are other mm -hmm. infusions in there. Mm -hmm. And then there's the art. And then there's the question on the day and the right. context. Right. So I do, I, I would love to see people having more contextual conversations and I know that a lot of us do that in our membership spaces mm -hmm. like it makes me think how do we bring this to our public yeah. spaces yeah I mean it's 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 difficult because we're you're these are diff more difficult things to talk about and to figure out a way to express than just like oh here's this new deck I got yeah. um so we do, and and there is a sense I think of when you talk about how you're interpreting a reading. There's a there's a vulnerability to that. So I think that's another reason why a lot of that put in our put that in our member spaces. Yeah. Like my I can't tell you how many times I show up in my member space and I'm like I'm a hot mess because I have just like woken up and I'm like okay so today like here's what's going on in my life and this is the hot mess of shit I've got going on. But like let's talk about it because this is real life. And maybe I'll pull cards or whatever around that. But I think there's that that layer of vulnerability because it's hard to talk contextually about a reading without Content. adding some personal things mm. to it. I do that in my one shot readings. They always call me out on my dirty laundry and I'm like, yep, OK, this is what's happening. Like, here's my real life and this is the real shit I'm going through right now. And the cards are going to call me out. Those videos, I wouldn't be able to do them if I wasn't including the personal layer to it, because they wouldn't make any sense. They'd be like, well, uh, this just be random cards laying on the table that I'm like, okay, this means this and this means this. But if I don't tell you why it means that, it makes no sense whatsoever. No. And it doesn't make for good listening for other people. Either. No. It doesn't help them learn or get anything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I know what you mean. And I've tried before to include um, – like I'll go, oh, I'll just read a couple of cards together just to give you a taster, but not for me. And then, of course, mm -hmm. I've pulled the cards, so they start dishing. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. I don't even pretend to do sample readings anymore because it's never a sample okay. reading. If I'm going to pull cards in a video or anywhere, it's going to air my dirty laundry every time, yeah. and I've just learned to be okay with that. This is – we're here. <laughs> this is my real life. And, but also I think it does show – how the the cards change you know based on on what's going on mm -hmm. when i was first learning tarot one of the things that um was said to me was because we were i learned with the numerological and the elemental and that's the that's the bones of the structure but what's on the card the art is very very important to how i read as well as any intuition any intuitive hits that i get because here's the thing that was said to me if the artwork didn't matter the cards would look like playing cards they wouldn't be depicted with art. So to completely discount that and to say when a three of swords hits your table, granted that that card, I have design issues with that card because it never changes. It's so People, boring, right? And creators will do these beautiful decks that like reimagine and then you get the three of swords and you're like, it's a heart with three swords. Like really? That Who the, did? The eight of wands. And the eight of wands. Yep, that's another one. Eight of wands <laughs> every time. But it's like, so that's a bad example of the the art. But in, in yeah. the majority of decks, it's not that dissimilar from Oracle, whereas the art actually means something. Otherwise, it would just say on it, three of swords, five of swords, whatever it is. And then you would just read it like a playing card deck. We have that with playing cards. Yeah, like, we can do that. It's cards. We could do that. Yeah, it's great. I love playing card divination. But if I'm going to work with a pictorial language, Mm. then the art should be a part of that conversation, in my opinion. So, And this is what I say to people. Yeah. When you go to an art museum, you stand there, and even if you know why, which often the reasons why artists drew things in the spaces they were in, especially the old stuff, you know, when you go back to, like, mm. Van Gogh and, I don't know, Picasso, there's very little mm. actual reference to why or what mood they were in or what was going mm -hmm. on them and you stand there and you have a relationship and an emotion and a presence with it and you mm -hmm. 
you sort of converse with it and that was always mm-hmm. my experience in art museums from a young age was mm-hmm. like you decided what does this mean what's the story like mm-hmm. I wonder what they were thinking feeling saying mm-hmm. and it's yeah it's the same for me it's such a big mm-hmm. language we talk about symbols and how symbols can be interpreted in such different ways so mm-hmm. then expanding that ev- even into scenes of mm-hmm. course and I just I can't understand I'm cool with people not wanting to read like that I just mm-hmm. can't understand the the ones that feel like it's a, not a viable way mm-hmm. of reading and I'm like well I feel and I've got a lot looser with this over time as well I feel like mm-hmm. most ways of reading are viable ways of reading because mm-hmm. I know a a fair handful of therapists, including myself, who read, and that influences the way we read as well. And Mm -hmm. some of them, they know zero systems. They Mm -hmm. use the cards as a sounding point with the people that they're working with and Mm -hmm. utilise the therapeutic information they've got and the visual and the person, and that is a Mm -hmm. conversation between them. And Mm -hmm. never have I been in the times I've been fortunate enough to be privy to it or been taught it or had someone tell me about their experience with it have they ever said that it was a bad experience didn't make sense to them anything wrong Mm -hmm. was you know all of those people came away enriched and I think that's the Mm -hmm. thing well if if your readings are enriching you or if you're doing them for other people and when Mm -hmm. I say I don't always mean like yay good but right uh, yeah if yeah getting something from them be it fun Mm -hmm. watching and interpreting a video show Mm -hmm. um to you know doing some deep work with ourselves Mm -hmm. if if it's doing what it's doing and it's and it's good it's working Mm -hmm. it's working yeah i'd i say like it's really nobody's business how anybody else reads the cards it really isn't and how what we share you know publicly about that like if you don't like the way somebody reads cards, like you you legit don't have to watch their channel. Exactly, you can always <laughs> find someone who yeah is vibe with you. And the, and I say mm-hmm. this to people about readers as well. Like if every reader that that was out there read the same, then all of the people that didn't like that reading style would be absolutely screwed. Whereas yeah. that's the great thing that there's a plethora yeah. of. Us. I am a hundred percent not a reader for everyone. In fact, I would argue mm-hmm. I'm a reader for very few. Because mm-hmm. of the things like I don't answer certain questions and mm-hmm. whilst I'm not giving people therapy because they are two very different things, it's heavily infused mm-hmm. by that. So I'm probably mm-hmm. going to ask some questions that mm-hmm. maybe people don't want to be asked or don't want to hear mm-hmm. or, you know, the space that I hold is going to feel different to another reader. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that the variety of readers is freaking awesome, and I, I do just, too. Yeah, I wish people would just lighten up and, like you say, if it's not for yeah. you, you don't have to have a bad feeling about it. You can just move. Yeah, you on. can just move on. I love watching other readers who who read differently than I do because I get to experience tarot from their perspective, yeah. and it's different than my own. And I I enjoy that. It's one of the reasons why I do actually like to watch walkthroughs versus like a flip through, because I want to hear what you think about that card, that yeah. deck. I want to know what your interpretation is. Just like, what does the art say to you? Because there's so many times where I will come away from a walkthrough and have a new idea about a card, an image, a symbol, whatever. And I watch walkthroughs on decks I already own by people who I appreciate their point of view. So like I may have used that deck for 20 years, but I will totally watch you do a walkthrough on it as a first yeah. impression or whatever, because I want to know what you think about it now. And I think that's so cool. I think that's an underrated value to walkthroughs that because we go through, I think in the in the community, we go through phases where things are popular and then we like crap all over them for a while. Yeah. I don't know why we do that, but we do. So walkthroughs, we crap all over for, on occasion. Yeah. And I, the, oh, it's consumerism and it's, it's like, consumer, but it's not, it's I mean, some, for some people, maybe it is for some yeah. people, maybe it is. I don't know what their intention. I, there are a few channels out there that I do get decks and then they show the decks and then it is a consumerism thing they're trying. But if you know that going in, there have been videos I've watched from channels like that because I'm thinking about buying the deck 
Yeah. I don't need an hour long dissertation. I just want to know. Card stock. Do I actually want that deck? Yeah. <laughs> Card stock. Yeah. Is it freaking gilded? Like, am I going to have to chop the damn thing down? Like, that's what I want to know. And so I think there's a time and a place for all of that. Yeah. Once I get the deck, then yeah, I want to watch an hour long walkthrough by my tar favorite tarot tubers, you know, talking about the in depth and the cards and things like that. But I think they all, they all have value yeah. in, in, in this, in this space. And they all have different, you know, strengths and things that they bring to the community and the conversation. Oh, I, I don't know why, why we go through the phases of like crapping all over things. I mean, I, I inadvertently do it sometimes too, because I've said before, like, I don't do first impressions on my channel. Well, it's because I do my hot take weird ass first impression with my members. And like, yeah. I'm like, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, and I forget to talk about the deck that I am looking at most of the time because like a card or something and I'll think about all oh, this thing that happened over here and I'm like I'm off in La La Land okay nobody but a member is gonna want to hear me yeah. rabbit you really got a love listening to our voices for that shit <laughs> <laughs> right because yeah. I am like I haven't talked about the deck that's in my hand for 10 minutes but we're still looking at it and I'm still telling you a story about yeah you know, whatever popped into my mind. And so like, there's a, I think, cause that's a different sort of energy because I don't really, I don't want my first impressions to be like something for consumer. You know, it's not, it's not a produced video. Yeah. It's just that, Hey, I got this new, like I save them. It's a hell of a video. I save up everything for a whole month and I sit down with my members and a cup of coffee and I'm like, let's do it. We've got so like oh, actually, 10 decks. That, that for me is like, but as you say, it's the variety. Like I like yeah. all of those aspects mm -hmm. and you just engage with them for different reasons. So if it's mm -hmm. one of your favorite people, yes, like I will watch oh, hours. There's a few people mm -hmm. who, because they started their YouTube later than like you and I, mm -hmm. I've actually completed their YouTubes because it's easier to do mm -hmm. that. So like right, yeah. a couple yeah. of people who I'm like, oh, I've watched all your videos and they're like, uh -huh. surely not. And I'm like, no. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I've watched like, I'm pretty sure I've watched all of your videos, but that's been for several, several that's years. <laughs> and then, well, and then you have Patreon videos. So I get to watch those too. Oh, but right they're, long. they're oh they're great i freaking love them i love them that's to me getting access to like my favorite tarot tubers or content creators or whatever getting that level of access to them is one of the reasons why i like to do memberships or page like why i'm a part of other people's and and i with my own membership that's like kind of always in the back of my mind like what do i get out of it like when i join one what do i want to see and i want to see that side of things because if i'm paying to be in your space i must really like you so yeah. i want to hear you talk and i'm fine with that there are other people that i'm like i'm going to watch you on two times speed because i just i i just need to look at whatever you're looking at or whatever but then there are other people where i'm like I could listen to you talk all day long. You can just hang out with me in the background and we'll just hang out. <laughs> and it's that weird like parasocial thing where it's like, I feel like we're friends because I've listened to you for 12 hours today. So I feel like we're friends. <laughs> well, and it is that in itself is quite intimate, isn't it? And especially mm -hmm. that's what I say to people. And it's not, it's always hard to talk about your membership spaces without sounding like you're trying to sell something. Right. And mm -hmm. at the same time, it's like, well, I need people to know that they are different. And it's not mm -hmm. just different because because people pay that is an element to it and I do mm -hmm. I, I will put myself through the ringer and make sure that I get the content mm -hmm. done but in the same vein it's safer for us it's more intimate in space yeah you know I don't come yeah. and get verbally abused on my freaking mm -hmm. Patreon content and you know mm -hmm. what I don't want to get verbally abused <laughs> right all yeah. the time and it's yeah really common at the moment or in, in mm -hmm. my sphere mm -hmm. so it's yeah it's that intimate space and so it's so mm -hmm. freeing in that sense mm -hmm. and I think the funny thing is one of the things for me with a Patreon was the hope that eventually it would get me to a space where it not only helps me to just pay to live um, mm -hmm. but it also helped me to engage with other people's paid content as well like that's part mm -hmm. of the aim is so that mm -hmm. the money can go back into community it cycles back in yeah 
yeah. and it's just sort of getting to that point mm-hmm. but um yeah it's so it's so much more free reign and mm-hmm. I, I really love that but it mm-hmm. is funny because yeah. like the same as you I definitely do the unboxings on there or I have done them on Instagram as well but mm-hmm. certainly on on Patreon as you will then know it's like I'll unbox an animal deck in particular mm-hmm. I get three cards in and talk about an experience I had with the animal right I'm not talking about the deck and anymore. that's and that's not for everybody like that's not for everybody which is why like the majority of people who watch like my channel probably don't want to listen to me talk about like some random weird ass experience I had when I was 13 because this card made me think of it. Right. And then for 10 minutes, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to keep flipping cards because this is what we're doing. There's a deck in my hand. It's a different kind of, a different kind of experience. And I think that any sort of membership space, it's, I think one of the things that people don't really understand is like it creates safe space for the content creator. Most everybody that I know that has some sort of a paid space like that, it's not about the money. It's about creating a safe space where we can actually be a little bit more vulnerable and share on a little bit more of a personal level without that, um, you know, any random person can now know about, you know, this intimate detail of your life type of thing. Yeah, and I think people fail to remember as well, like, the internet and the way it works without getting too, like, oh, algorithms and AI, Mm -hmm. but it tells, like, Facebook still recommends me, I don't use Facebook, but I've got it for the, Mm -hmm. like, uh, the tarot swap, you know, when you try Mm -hmm. and sell something or trade something, Mm -hmm. it's the only purpose I have a Facebook still, and I go on there and it still recommends me adding people from my school from, like, Mm -hmm. years like no I don't want to add my old bullies thank you very much no yeah thanks I've got new ones now that's that's great I'm good (laughs) but it's like if it's recommending and we've got no shared contacts like I I have a pitiful I've got like 40 friends on Facebook it's not Mm -hmm. I don't use it they're all family or old family friends I haven't Mm -hmm. posted there in about four years Mm mm-hmm no oh my god why am I saying I probably haven't posted there in about eight years so Mm -hmm. it's like it's not a thing but I know and you only have to say something to one of our phones and like or something that Dave looks up on his phone I'll then start getting adverts for on my phone Mm -hmm. none of our accounts are linked it's absolutely insane there is no (laughs) secret whatsoever so it's like well there are often and it's not just me but reasons why other people might not want to be fully accessible on a public platform Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. taken me a long time to think well what would happen if one of my you know my psychotherapy clients found my youtube because Mm -hmm. whilst I'm not someone who completely is like a blank slate with my clients and tries to have Mm -hmm. no personality um right it's they still they don't know loads about my interests because it's not important mm-hmm. to the therapy and also right. it really change how they feel so, mm-hmm. right yeah it's, um, it's definitely been a, a consideration for a long time like what yeah. happens I think I'm more chilled out about it now but mm-hmm. also I do have the occasional clients who are very creative and artistically inclined and mm-hmm. uh, never tarot decks because again the sort of taboo around them but art decks, mm-hmm. or decks may end up a part of the therapy sessions anyway but mm-hmm. um, there are so many reasons why people don't necessarily have that mm-hmm. safety net on the whole of public youtube can you imagine just being randomly recommended to like well i don't know <laughs> yeah it's like somebody you wouldn't want to see your stuff yeah no, I, I totally get that. I, the the membership too, because I know like in your membership, we both offer practices yeah. in our membership. So it is beyond also just the, you know, here's here's access to me, like more access to me type of a thing. But um, your, so you do your, your animal uh, gnosis practice mm. and you also have your, you have your coven. I'm trying to think what all's in, like I'm at the top tier, whatever. <laughs> So, I don't think what all I have access to. <laughs> sort of flit around, don't I? So sometimes yeah. I do some folklore stuff. Sometimes I do mm-hmm. some. I like to utilize the therapeutic knowledge that I have and try and do interactive, cathartic, therapeutic mm-hmm. self development care, reflection, enter all of the bingo words that yeah you know, that 
are yeah. useful to people but that are safe for people to practice without mm-hmm. a therapeutic like mm-hmm. guidance like basically without a therapist because the thing mm-hmm. is a lot of people are doing that stuff online nowadays anyway so yeah. I'd rather put things out there that I know that are sort of psychoeducational and safe and creative so it's that nice mix of like oh it's not just all up in here Mm-hmm. I think that's probably the main other exercises I offer, but coming mm-hmm. up with them takes sometimes months. I don't yeah. know how to create what you do because when people are talking about your, I can't remember the name of your thing that you're doing for the whole year. Oh, the fellowship, yeah. It's people tell me about it and I'm like, yeah, I, I like a slice of your brain, please, because. <laughs> It takes me sometimes months to come up with like one. I did a tarot exercise that was inspired by many therapeutic things. You could say sandbox stuff, animal stuff. It's like mm-hmm. when people use things to identify people and relationships. And mm-hmm. I did a tarot version of that. And I mean, that took me two months to sort mm-hmm. of formulate and flesh out in a way where I thought, okay, this is safe enough for people like to try it and enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And it be traumatizing (laughs) right but I don't know how you think of such huge interactive things that last a whole year because that's yeah it's well I mean in all like it took me a year to put it together so it was like and I'm still I'm still tweaking and we still do like interact like I have to put next week I have to put together the whole we're doing a three-day online fair thing (laughs) So like in the whole journey, we're, it's, it's going to be a whole thing, but anyway, I have to put all that together because that hasn't been put together yet. But the overall practice thing, it, like, that's the thing it takes, it, it takes a long time to do it. That's like, it, it's clear. I don't do it for the money. <laughs> like, no, that's oh my true, goodness. Right? It's, I tried to explain to people, if you actually get the hours and the energy mm-hmm. and the amount of time that we work, then mm-hmm. it's it's well below minimum wage like it's well not, below yeah it's yeah. not even close we're talking about like being given half a coffee for doing like <laughs> a week's worth. a week's worth of work yeah. yeah yeah it's not it's not about that it's absolutely a, a passion thing as well yeah sure. mine was just I think- I I want to take the whole idea of of narrative journey like we see in D&D and put it with tarot and so that's that's what I did. Cause I'm like, that sounds like fun to me. I'm going to do it. So who wants to do it with me is kind of how basically all my member content goes. I'm doing this crazy thing. Who wants to go along for the ride? <laughs> yeah. But that's what's exciting because that's refreshing as well. And I feel like the more refreshing stuff that comes out and the creative stuff about tarot, the more accessible it is for people. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about it just being accessible for the masses. I'm just talking mm-hmm. about it being accessible because life changes. We know health mm-hmm. changes like this. Mm-hmm. Some you can't show up or you don't want to show up or it doesn't fit anymore. And mm-hmm. we change and we evolve constantly. And uh, the one way that tarot has remained more consistent for me now than it had in the past is because it evolves with me and that changes. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. why when people say to me, oh, well, we'd love to hear what a daily practice is for you. And I'm like, I I don't know how to answer that question anymore because mm-hmm. it literally depends on what my body's doing and my other mm-hmm. commitments. And mm-hmm. that. I've been trying to make that video for five years because <laughs> how do you do Like, how do you do it? Today, I could show you what it's like today. Yeah. Like, Tomorrow, it'll look yeah. totally different. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And like my mood right now, and it might look totally different by the end of the day too, because like there's a whole day's worth of stuff that could happen in between then and now. So yeah, so yours like it's, is quite fluid as well. Yeah, it's kind of a the the thing that I have a few practices that are, are kind of like the backbone, and then everything else just weaves in and out of that. But even there are times when even those get on the put on the back burner because it, usually for me it's because I'm I'm busy and I'm like I have to choose am I gonna make this for someone or do this for me and that becomes the two the two balancing act that I have to do most of the time but like even the like the the fellowship thing that I'm doing that is my anchor this year so if I do nothing else tarot wise and I do that that's my anchor. And I weave everything else in, in between. 
And I, I imagine your animal gnosis is, is very similar to that. Yeah, it's the, it yeah. very much is. So I'll pull tarot around it sometimes, mm-hmm. but certainly like I could not touch the cards and still be working with the animal gnosis. And there have mm-hmm. been months when that very much, it's like, ah, I'm in hospital a lot. The animal mm-hmm. gnosis is there. That's what I'm mm-hmm. working with. There's no cards. Mm-hmm. There's no tools. There's nothing for anyone to mm-hmm. see or me to hold. It's just that focus Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah very much the backbone and as you say even Mm -hmm. then sometimes it it (laughs) very much it's fluid uh, yeah yeah there are I think one of the things that I I would say I like to do but also it's become a non-negotiable for me which you will have known as well is that I have at least a month off every year of Patreon Mm -hmm. because it's just I get to a point and I'm like oh I have nothing to give <laughs> like, I, need, I need a month yeah. or to just it sounds really peculiar but just to have an animal gnosis to myself just mm-hmm. one month oh I I totally get that yeah I totally there's get that because there's only I don't know if you get this but there's only so much of my practice I can share And that's Mm -hmm. because I'm always trying to say to people, add your relationship, add your feelings, Mm -hmm. add your cultural experience, Mm -hmm. add your folklore from where you live or whatever Mm -hmm. makes some people don't want those bits. Like Mm -hmm. add one and make it your own. Don't just assume it has to look like mine because Mm -hmm. some of the ways that I do mine are so unexciting and mundane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I am... I know it's very cliche in the witchy world now, but it's not everywhere else. I do. I just go and sit in the garden and I wait for the first insect to crawl on me that pays attention mm-hmm. to me that day. And I mm-hmm. sit and I talk to them and I have a look in the garden and see if mm-hmm. it's like too hot and I need to put some water out. And that's my practice. But mm-hmm. I, and that's very hard to excite other people about. Right. <laughs> Or to make, you know, really high producing videos about, right? Yeah, like, here's me sitting in the garden, trying uh-huh. to get through my morning pain and speaking mm-hmm. to tiny insects, which later I'll go and get a field guide and work out what insect it mm-hmm. was. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. So. That's like, that's practice in real life. I mean, so much of, I think, practice in general is not glamorous. No, it's, it's not aesthetic it's just it's the it's the everyday messy part of living and we're just trying to find our way through that really yeah it very much yeah. so and that's what I say to people like if you pull a card out and you put it out and put it on the side and forget about it you can go back to it later or you can just think mm-hmm. oh well crap I didn't pay attention to that reading try again another day like, yep there's really no rules it's okay and I think yeah It's the difference. One of the things I try and do, I think you try and do it a lot. I know a lot of people, they try and do it as well, is talk about a practice from an owned perspective because Mm -hmm. then people know, okay, well, I could do it that way, but I don't Mm -hmm. have to Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that makes the difference. It's like you can do what you want and everyone has like – as as someone who reads for other people and has done for, you know, quite a while now – I would always hope that people know. Sometimes I pull a card for myself and I'm like, what? And I just yeah. look at it and I'm like, I'm just going to have to come back to you later. Because yeah. <laughs> Two cards. I do the same. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. Uh, yeah. It's just, you don't mean nothing to me. Or there have been times where I pull a card and I'm like, I really want to put that back. I don't like that one. Yeah. I just, I don't like that one. I don't like yeah. you today. <laughs> I'm I'm not friends with you. I probably should yeah. have cards today. Yep. Right. Or, Maybe I need to rehome this deck because this deck is being a real dick right now. Like, definitely. You know. I definitely yeah. personify decks more than I used to as well. Like, that's something mm-hmm. I I think I I was very um, analytical at one point when I came in and I've definitely loosened up. And, yeah, my mm-hmm. decks have personalities. And when they're being dicks, I'm mm-hmm. like, I will put you in the corner. <laughs> I will put you in the corner. Absolutely. You will go in storage until you learn how to behave. Yep, that's yeah. absolutely a thing I do. <laughs> exactly. But I don't think, yeah, I think, I don't, I didn't personify my decks when I first, very first started working with tarot. That would have really never occurred to me. But also, I only had, like, one yeah 
And I think eventually I got like another one. And then eventually I got another one. Like I had a whole three decks for like over a decade. And that was all I had. So they didn't really have, I didn't see the personalities. They were also all Rider Waite Smith decks. So essentially they kind of had the same personality. But now with like indie decks and decks doing completely different things and going their own way with it, like you can actually see the nuances and like personifying them is just how I articulate that into a way that my little human brain can make sense of it. Because if I give it a personality, then I can make sense of that energy versus otherwise it just feels like this big overarching thing that I'm like, I don't know what to do with you. (laughs) Like you're so big. But if I can say you have this personality and today we're having this conversation, it makes it easier for me to personalize my readings and my practice. Well, and I, we have a we have a relationship with the artwork in the deck, right? And some artwork mm-hmm. makes us feel different to others. And mm-hmm. also, I think the most interesting one that really caught me, and it's just one of those weird things that you can't put into words and it doesn't make me feel special or anything like that. It's just interesting that I have always been able, for the most part, to tell the decks that were created when someone was going through grief. And Mm -hmm. it was then when I started to realise this is a grieving deck. This is a grieving Mm -hmm. deck. It's not that the decks are heavy or morbid, but there's something about how I felt when I was using them. And I knew Mm -hmm. it when I was using the, um, what's it called, the Iris Oracle. And I knew Mm -hmm. it when I was using the Lioness Oracle Tarot. And then I read Mm -hmm. about the experiences that the people were going through and it sort of reinforced that. And I was like, that's so interesting that Mm -hmm. it almost those decks I was drawn to them during those times as well and Mm -hmm. so it has to be something that was mirroring in the artwork Mm -hmm. for me and so it very much it does it has for me it's like it's the personality they put into it it's the personality that I pick up from it it's our Mm -hmm. relationship there's so Mm -hmm. many layers to it and yeah it's definitely why I've got as many decks as I've got (laughs) same and sometimes when I'm looking through I'm like oh man I've got way too many decks but then for the ones that I have, it's like, okay, it's like, pick your favorite child. Okay. Yeah. Pick your favorite pet. Pick, you know, pick your favorite friend. Well, all of them bring different things to the table. So, exactly. and there have been, like, I put them in storage now, but, you know, when, when they misbehave or when, you know, I outgrow them or whatever. I mean, I think that's a valid thing too. Sometimes we outgrow decks, just like we outgrow relationships. And because I personify my decks and I look at them in that relationship sort of sense, like we're having, because I I feel like each of my readings is like a communion with, with that. And so we're having a conversation and sometimes you outgrow relationships and you outgrow decks. But a lot of times I just, I put them away for a while and then I'll bring them back because like, I don't know, just what if I need that? What if I need that? Like, what if at some point I'm going to that friend and that friend is no longer there because I've shipped them off to someone else and then I have to buy that friend again. Done that one too. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's never fun when that happens to people and the decks are no longer in print. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a thing. Yeah. Done that one a couple times too. Like, oh, yeah. probably shouldn't have been so hasty, but I have gotten caught up in the whole, um, you know, deck declutter thing that's happened. I think there was a real big push on that in the community, like right around the pandemic time or just after the pandemic, which totally makes sense. Mm. Completely makes sense. You know uh, why we were all, I think, feeling drawn to do that or why a lot of people were, but then like looking back, I'm like, Oh man, that was like a knee jerk reaction. And that's not. Yeah. It's very, those streams are very cyclical and I've experienced Mm -hmm. a couple of rounds of them now in the community. Mm -hmm. I'm very, I'm very mindful of them for that Mm -hmm. exact reason um it's also why I stopped having those conversations in public I think the last one I spoke about was probably on my Patreon saying look Mm -hmm. people have asked me to talk about this in public I'm not doing it anymore I've said my two Mm -hmm. cents Mm -hmm. twice over the years and also I don't feel like it adds anything because at the end of the day if it feels right for the person at that time that's cool I don't mind Mm -hmm. listening to their perspective of why they did it again Mm -hmm. it's that overarching like you say Mm -hmm. say, well if you've got this many then it means this and if you've got this Mm -hmm. and I have zero tolerance for that Mm -hmm. whatsoever because I don't want to be spoken for and also Mm -hmm. I'm not into the whole like 
someone else's truth is my truth because mm-hmm. he is and I think we've spoken about this before there are everyone has a plethora of reasons and different mm-hmm ways that they show up and exist in the world Mm -hmm. if I was still really able-bodied and doing all of the things I was doing before I got all of these things wrong with me I would definitely still have more than two decks but I would Mm -hmm. have around half because Mm -hmm. then maybe I wouldn't hang on to the ones that are just kind of there for just in case Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd be doing other stuff with my money and my time but Mm -hmm. this is my existence like a lot more than other people's and I think that's Mm -hmm. interesting as well like some people tap into tarot land they watch Mm -hmm. they ingest they have a few decks they go out and do all of these other things Mm -hmm. I don't go out and do all of these other things this isn't the only part of my personality but it's a big solid part now because yeah what being disabled is like for me so Mm -hmm. it's like these are my sanity this is my art Mm -hmm. this is my outdoor world when I can't get out there Mm -hmm. and it's such a powerful thing that I just really hope that the the tarot community gets to a space where they more people are holding space for all of the nuances and differences Mm -hmm. and that we can all just talk about them and that they're fun and interesting rather than more assumptions and judgments Mm -hmm. yeah I agree I that's really interesting too about the nature thing I like I'm allergic to everything but I love plants I have a plethora of botanical decks because I can't interact with them physically because they all make me sick so I have way more botanical decks than I need do I need eight different flower oracles that all have the same plants on them nope but I can't interact with those things physically I love them so So that's a way that I can experience that energy in a safe way for me. Yeah. Although one of these days I really need to actually learn about plant. Because every time I pull out a botanical deck, I'm like, I don't know jack shit about this plant, but I think it's really pretty. (laughs) I literally watched your video today. I haven't commented on it yet, but you were your mod video and you Mm -hmm. had the dirt gems and you were like, (laughs) I'm going to mod it. No, I'm not going to mod it. Maybe I won't keep it. Oh, but I love the art. <laughs> and I'm like, I totally get it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's my real brain. <laughs> yeah. For me, I suppose, and this is one of the things I've been saying to people about the animal stuff is whilst I can work with animal decks that have no keywords on, if, mm-hmm. and I don't know why anyone would ask for my advice, but if anyone did bless me and ask for my advice on creating a deck, I would tell them time and time again put at least one keyword on it. Don't Mm -hmm. worry about the people who don't like keywords. They are far less in the grand scheme of things. And a Mm -hmm. lot of those people will happily ignore. Sorry, keyword Mm -hmm. people who hate keywords. But to me, it's like, I can't use a plant deck that doesn't have keywords on it, which is why I have zero of them at the moment because Mm -hmm. I tried and I tried and I tried. And (laughs) I don't mod decks because... I'm not great at it and also it, it aggravates like my hand pain and mm-hmm. stuff. but I'm like if they could just I am the same I love plants I have plant books I don't grow them I don't I'm not a good cook like I just say plants <laughs> yeah. they're beautiful and amazing and I I, I respect them and it mm-hmm. would just be great if there was a few keywords on some just give them. me something something to work with like because like I, I get that that's that type of plant but what am I supposed to do with it and yeah. and we can't like, know everything right so you'll right. have special interests I have special interests like again and even I people say oh she'll know they'll ask me like oh do you know what this animal means in this folklore or whatever mm-hmm. and okay 85 90 percent of the time I'm good to go I can answer mm-hmm. I don't know all of the animals like mm-hmm. and I'm not as intimately familiar with all of them as well so you can still catch me out <laughs> right yeah <laughs> yeah oh, not a not a walking encyclopedia yeah I don't I don't get that I have a lot of like weird hang-ups with the decks do you have any weird hang-ups with decks like if like the key no keyword we all know how I feel about gilding I'm not quite about gilding cardstock that I can't shuffle (laughs) I have to say yeah I have a lot and it's got worse because of like the pain stuff so physical things like yeah yeah. and the same tactile I'm like you when you Mm -hmm. were talking about 
the edge of it biting you or I think you said mm-hmm. scratching and I often say mm-hmm. to people the um the US games card stock that's that really cardboardy one feels mm-hmm. like it's biting me yeah and people are like what and I'm I just can't explain it the cardboard edges are like sharp and rigid mm-hmm. I don't like them I do feel that keywords just make sense on oracles Mm -hmm. I don't understand if you want to call something the whimsical wind keeper of the West, that's fine, but it means absolutely nothing to me. Absolutely nothing. (laughs) (laughs) What am I supposed to do with that? No, and I'm pretty good. Like one of my, one of my friends said to me, my superpower is being able to make a piece of tarot artwork make sense for the, for the tarot card, no matter Mm -hmm. if it's terrible and doesn't make sense or not. Right. I, yep, that's a superpower. Not with those weird wishy washy oracles. So that's mm-hmm. being very similar to you. Like I am not a fan of gilding. It's just I don't get it. It's I don't me, get it either. I'm a little old school. I like original card stock that used to bend and feel like card stock. Mm-hmm. Same flashy shiny edges or cards that are infallible to the point that they can't be shuffled (laughs) I do not understand like do publishers forget that these are tools it's I'm not gonna hang it on my wall if I was gonna hang it on my wall or use it as a coaster for my drink because I have several decks that I could use as coasters and they would work beautifully yeah. Like I need to be able to to work with it. And sometimes I wonder with what publishers or even some indie card creators. And I'm like, I, okay, did you just make a, an art deck? Because then call it an art deck. And if I'm not supposed to actually shuffle yeah. and use it, great. Just let me know that that is your expectation with this and why you are producing it in the way that you are. Because if I'm buying a tarot deck to use, I'm expecting I'm going to be able to shuffle said deck Yes. preferably riffle said tech <laughs> and then actually you know use it put it on my table and use it i i don't understand the like i get the production value and i think this is also part of the community's like we oh, did this yeah we did this we all because did. yeah because we either fawned over this ridiculous card stock that nobody can use but like tactilely maybe it feels really cool the first time but like to actually yeah. use it I did good. I did it. Oh, I've done it. I've totally done it. And I regret every second of saying the rose was good because I, it hurts my hands to high health. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's totally, it's totally our fault that we have decks that we can't shuffle, that we have decks that are gilded and blingy and like five sizes too big. It's fashion. Yeah, absolutely. Tarot fashion, deck fashion. Yeah, I think in sort of like the opposite to the hang-ups is like some of my favourite decks are cardstock that people love, like the medicine cards. Because I've spoken about that oracle so much over the years, people go, I've got to get it and find out. And I'm like, well, Mm -hmm. uh, don't expect magic because I love (laughs) this deck for sentimental reasons. Right. Like, I mean, I think it's amazing, but it's just not going to work for everyone and no keywords. But they Mm -hmm. get it and they go what the hell is this and you can literally like bend it all bend mm-hmm. all the way in half and you hold it up and it's see-through and it obviously it's got mm-hmm. that and I'm like yeah but this I've had my copy since I was like I don't know five eight something like that mm-hmm. and it's still not like it's got barely any damage on it and that was mm-hmm. when I was running around like a rug rat throwing it in the mud right. and not looking after it mm-hmm. and I'm like yep yeah, but I have to say, I am trying to rectify my own part in that in the community. So I recently got a, I was so excited about it, it's ridiculous. I recently got a US Games, um, and it's actually funny enough, I call it my fashion deck. It's mm-hmm. called Mind's Eye Tarot. Have you seen it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I got that. It very much reminds me of the fashion drawings I used to do years ago when I studied fashion. Mm-hmm. And I really love the black backgrounds with the pops of colour and stuff. Yeah. And they've done it on their new linen cardstock. Now, it does have the the silly blingy uh, edges, but it's not Mm -hmm. sharp. At least mine's not. Mm -hmm. But it's flexible linen cardstock. It's so close to an indie other than it's probably mildly cheaper. 
mm-hmm. um, like the core or whatever. And so I thought, right. And I went onto US Games. I know I'm only one person, but I don't care. I went onto US Games Instagram. I scrolled all the way down to find the time that they shared it. And I commented, mm-hmm. I've just got this. This cardstock is so usable, so hand friendly, great size. Mm-hmm. Really love it, guys. Mm-hmm. Hope you continue. And I thought that's all I know what to do is like positive. Thought, yeah. <laughs> but yes. Please give us cardstock we can use. It's like, you know, yeah. people, I know a lot of people don't like Llewellyn cardstock. I I love my Llewellyn decks. You know why? I can use them. Yeah, they are they're very useful. They're a great size. Like just whether it's their shiny ones or their new, like they're doing some new linen stuff too, which is great. I love the linen. Like I hope that's the place that we end. Like card, it's a card. Like, yes, let's make them like playing cards. Like I have very few playing card decks that aren't linen because that's yeah. usually what playing cards are on. It's still a card deck, whether it's got 78 or 52 or, you know, whatever, yeah. however many. A deck's a deck, yeah. A deck is a deck. It's meant to be shuffled and used. Otherwise, call it what it is, and it's an art deck, and you're not supposed to shuffle it or use it, Yeah. which is totally valid. Yeah. I I've just got... want to know what I'm buying. <laughs> exactly. And I do have one. Like I say to people, I am a... I'm a an active collector in that, and we all make our own language. A collector's a collector's mm-hmm. a collector. We just have our different reasons. I mm-hmm. always use mine, obviously not every bloody week. There's no way I can get through all of these every week, but mm-hmm. I like to use them when I have the same thing you were talking about where it's like, actually, the time's probably come. I sort of put it to the side. It's six months. I'm still feeling the same about it. Off it goes Mm -hmm. into somewhere else into the world. But Mm -hmm. I have one deck that I literally just couldn't shuffle if I wanted to. But that's my Pokemon Tarot. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. that to me is a collector's item as a fan. So it's like I get it out. I coo over it. It sits with my Pokemon Pops and Mm -hmm. DS games and weird other bits. And that's Mm -hmm. fine. But I knew that going in. Mm Mm-hmm. I am fine with that. Right. And like you say, when you get one and it's like there are some for other people that I think are probably really still shuffleable, but that cardboard stuff for me, as soon as you bend mm-hmm. it, it increases, it breaks. It's mm-hmm. to me as well for a community that talks about being eco-friendly, if something isn't durable as a card deck, that's not a good start because mm-hmm. actually – the more, I mean, I've got a copy of the medicine cards that I've had since I was a kid. I'm now 35. Yeah, <laughs> 35. That has lasted. That to me is way more that's, friendly than yeah. having a deck that's damaged in two years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like it needs There's, to be usable. It needs to be usable. It's a tool. Like I just, I and, and like I do have some decks that I'm the same where they're just a collector. I, yeah. I don't want to use it like I won't use it or I have it just because it it's usually some sentimental reason. A lot of it's like nerd related stuff because it's yeah, in this I like fandom stuff. or whatever. You know, it's like I've got that stupid supernatural tarot. I don't use that deck. I have it. The deck is awful, but I have it because I watched that show. Yeah. So I was way late to the party watching it, but I watched it eventually and I was like, oh, cool, there's a deck. So for me in my brain, like, it's a deck. I'm going to get it. It's part of my little collection now. I don't ever use it. But it's mostly just because it's a bad deck. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I mean, the card stock's fine. That's more, to me, like, to loosely use the word normal, which isn't mm-hmm. really a concept, but, like, common. Like, my dad, yeah, he did read cards at one point but my dad has decks he has the um we both got the arcane bullshit oracle at the same time it was Mm -hmm. actually his idea because he's a giant child as well and um he's also been looking at the new uh fallout deck Mm -hmm. asking him well do you want it for father's day or not Mm -hmm. he's not going to read tarot with it but the Mm -hmm. artwork to him is like well i've got a collection of art from my one of my favorite franchises that literally he's Mm -hmm. played all of the games for he -hmm. will look through it he will put it on his special nerd shelf with his other Mm -hmm. nerd things and it Mm -hmm. and he's not part of our community at all Mm -hmm. so it's like 
it doesn't surprise me that people in our community do it because people mm-hmm. that are in our community. Not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like the, um, I have this deck that I, I finally was able to track down. It's the Dragon Age Inquisition deck, which came out with the game which I didn't get my hands on at the time and then had to eventually track down. But you know, the majority of people who have that deck are not tarot readers, they're gamers. Um, but the, the deck features in the game, so it makes sense. And it took, it took me forever to finally track one down. Mm-hmm. I have it, I don't use it. It's a special sentimental thing because now I have it because I've played all those games and everything and now I can relate back to that. But that's there's several instances where things like that happen where it's just it's not even a part of our community it's yeah and and there's so many D &D related thing that's a whole big booming thing that's happening where you're seeing tarot pop up in D &D communities with people who have no idea how to read tarot oh that's so interesting which is cool because they're like using it in campaigns and things like that and you know it's it's great it's i guess kind of more of that mainstreaming tarot although D D is not really mainstream either that's still a very segmented thing it's kind of like tarot in that way like this is a bunch of little weirdos over here but it is getting getting more popular like tarot is but i think that's really just because people like my age are now finally like in charge of things sort of and we're like we like the stuff from when we were kids so that's what we're bringing back we're gonna make D cool and we're gonna like you know bring back the i don't know what's little, little uh, like Doc Martens and things like that. I mean, like the first time I got to buy my kid a pair of Doc Martens, I was like, we've arrived. Yeah, <laughs> it is time. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's, it's, it's really cool though, how there are collectors and that's a totally different thing. I, I totally have decks I, I collect. I have creators I collect too, yeah. because I want to support their work. Yeah. I may not use their deck more than once, but I will own all of their decks to support their work. And I do that a lot too. Yeah. And it's, I, I think, like you said, there's a lot of decks being created, but there's not as many people in tarot world as, as people think. So it is, mm-hmm. it's kind of reliant on us. <laughs> right. to point. And it's not a false thing. You don't have to buy the no. stuff. But if you no. want to keep seeing that creator create stuff, then that's part and parcel of it, right? Mm-hmm. And it's art. Like, it's mm-hmm. a tool and it's art. And I, I mm-hmm. say to people, do you know how expensive it used to be to buy? Like, I have, because, again, one of my other nerdy interests is having, like, reference books meets field guides. So I've got, like, animal encyclopedias, mm-hmm. plant encyclopedias, but mm-hmm. also I like the ones where it's, like, talks about different parts of, like, this is a volcano, this is this, this is mm-hmm. whatever to buy those art books or even one from a museum would cost Mm -hmm. so much money because of the photography and Mm -hmm. all of the stuff that goes into it and all that has to be paid. The fact that we, even indie decks now, can get them at such an affordable price a lot of the time, Mm -hmm. own that much art from that person, Mm -hmm. that's wild. Yeah, it's if it's a tarot, it's 78 pieces of art. Yeah, that's It's it's just... It's so cool. It's it's but it's mind boggling. It's like I don't really have a problem with dropping money on an indie deck for somebody who spent, you know, the last three years of their life creating that that piece or whatever. Like, I think it's great. Yeah. Like and I'm excited to see some of some of the mass market publishers are picking up indie decks now because then that just makes it even more accessible to everybody, which is great. Yeah. And but, they're finally getting more interesting as well. Because I think there was a yes. point where, like mass market decks are very much much of the same, the same, the same. Mm. You would never have had a dirt gems like however many years Mm-mm. ago. Yeah. So it's um yeah, it's pretty it's pretty impressive. And I'm loving like I recently got the Citadel Oracle, which now mm-hmm. I'm wondering why I sat on it for so long. Because mm-hmm. that it's a nerdy delight. <laughs> it's that that deck is phenomenal. Love it's it. So good. It deserves yeah. to be in gameplay. Like it's yeah. It's so, good. so yeah, I think I, I think we're we're definitely spoiled for choice. And I'm happy, mm-hmm. like you say, there's I don't I don't go out and drink. I don't spend money on clothes very much. Mm-hmm. Like I just, those aren't things that I spend money on. Not because I have feelings about anyone else doing it. They're just not mm-hmm. things that I spend money on. Mm-hmm. So this is the little, you know, aside from mm-hmm. all of the zillion Switch games I own. Mm-hmm. 
this is where my money goes so yeah yeah it's um it's fun to have all of that selection mm. I feel like we're in a very fortunate spot for it right now mm-hmm. I feel like it's it's no it's not really any different than somebody who has like a library yeah like I mean I'm not I'm not in the whole book tube or talk or whatever like let me show my age but I'm not in that sphere of of things but I would I would imagine that like if I see, walk into somebody's house and they have a beautiful library, I'm like, that's amazing. Yeah. Right. You You've got know. like, <gasps> For sure. why did you spend all that money on all those books? Yeah. Like, and to be perfectly honest, I have books I will read once mm. and it will sit on my shelf and I will never read it again. Whereas a tarot deck, I'll use it yeah. many times. Yeah. It's not like it is similar, but it's not because to me, my decks are actually way more usable than my book collection. Yep, my book collection has been minimized greatly to mm -hmm. predominantly things that I still need to read, things that mm -hmm. I'll re-reference, either mm -hmm. animal-wise or witchy-wise or uh, psychotherapy-wise. And that's mm -hmm. it. Everything else mm -hmm. that I because I had a huge fiction collection years ago, mm -hmm. and it's like, I'm not going to read it again. So off mm -hmm. to the charity shop it went. Like, let someone mm -hmm. else enjoy it. But, yeah, like you say the reusability of a deck mm -hmm. they keep on giving until we get they more. keep on giving yeah <laughs> they're, they're great for that yeah yep decks and and well dice that's my that's my other i'm really excited for haven't you got a dice thing in the making yes lisa and i are working on our dice divination system which is so much fun and phenomenal like she's well i mean we're both busy but like she had to like put out a deck and stuff but <laughs> dice divination is next <laughs> i am so like i may have been silently excited about it but it's only ever been sort of like mentioned in your videos as an aside so mm -hmm. i haven't really commented about it but i have one set of dnd dice that my dear friend logan gifted me and they look like amazing. they're bleeding inside which is perfect for me that's um, amazing and because we've played um a group of us played <laughs> we've only done it twice sadly because sort of life happened and the, those mm -hmm. the people who were running the dnd then weren't able to but we did mm -hmm. a couple of online campaigns and uh, Logan was like, you have to have like an in-person set. So I've mm -hmm. now got these gorgeous dice, no one to play D&D &D with. And I'm still a noob. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite like, if someone was to take me on, I'm a lot of effort. Like all I know mm -hmm. is I've got a tiefling character. I sort of understand how some of it works. And mm -hmm. that's it. But I have these beautiful dice and nothing to do with them. And then you and Lisa were like, oh, we're going to do this dice. We will fix that. We will and fix I'm that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah because we we've been building it and that's the reason okay well i just like dice but i also have dice that go with certain decks now so that's that's a whole thing yeah you you mentioned uh i watched a video of yours and you had the um you've got like these hexagonal boxes for, i've got boxes right? with yeah and yeah about i don't know if you were talking about decks at the time but you were talking about characters because you've got your boyfriend mm -hmm. dice and then you've got some for something. And I remember watching mm -hmm. it and being like, you don't use your dice, Tegan. Don't get any more dice. <laughs> <laughs> but you will eventually. Yeah. You will. I yeah. am very much, I am a little bit of a, a, a bit of a, but I've always been like that. I've always been yeah. a, a, a collector of a few things at once. And I'm okay mm -hmm. with that because it Same. never goes yeah. into a realm of buying out of my means or hoarding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm cool with that. Like for years, I had a collection of marbles and I mm -hmm. adored them. And I am such mm -hmm. a tactile person. So mm -hmm. I think of a zillion ways to use them. So, yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I do feel dice itching under the surface. And I'm like, well, yeah. I'll wait till I've got a good reason. But as soon as I've got one, yep. I some other dice that I like. <laughs> yeah, that was part of part of when I started the the fellowship thing in that because we use dice in that and yeah. it's a part of the whole thing. And I was like, I love my dice and there's got to be a way to incorporate dice with tarot. So we started easing into it with that. And then Lisa and I were like, OK, but we can make a structure like we can make a system mm -hmm. like we can make an actual here's how you do working with a full set of D, D dice with a tarot deck and it's beautiful we've both been testing it out it works beautifully and hopefully very very soon that will be out like 
hopefully soon. <laughs> We're yeah, going to work on it. So, so many people have been asking about it. I'm like, I, I like, I promise, I promise yeah. it's coming because I keep talking about like, here's the, the dice I used and I did this dice reading with this deck and people are like, well, how? And I'm like, Oh, just wait. It's coming. Yeah. I promise. It's coming. <laughs> I will explain it all. It's going to become the teases of the internet. It's like, right? it's coming soon. <laughs> we'll look at all the pretty dice in the meantime. And I mean, I've got this dice matches this deck and this dice is used for this thing. And like incorporating the dice and the cards into our video game playing though was, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's insane, but it's so fun. And a crazy but, way to do it. Like, what an ingenuitive way to use your tools as well. Like, if people are worried mm -hmm. about, oh, how do I use my decks more often? But I don't want to perpet because who wants to perpetually read for themselves in no, such a yeah. depth as well? Yeah. And I'm like, trust me, there's lots of things you can do with decks. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't just have to be a whole big self development reading. Like, I mm -hmm. might use that as one of my main focuses because it's a skill of mine. But mm -hmm. that's certainly not all I use my tarot for so yeah I am yeah. I am very excited but I am quite a patient excited person so I, I don't like to pressure people I'm like it's cool <laughs> when it comes I will then be there at the front going yeah yeah it's it's gonna it's gonna be fun I mean that's the other thing of like oh what if we build it up and then like everybody else is like this sucks you guys are out of your mind and we're like oh maybe that that might happen it won't happen <laughs> it, it's impossible <laughs> I, I really, I get the worry because I often think about that. Like mm. when I, I remember releasing my little tarot e-spread book and thinking mm -hmm. like, yeah, probably about three people are going to be like, ooh, and that was it. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it did a lot better than I thought it was going to do. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I have every faith that when you give us the dice goodness that we are going <laughs> It's going to be... It's going to be amazing. I'm still that person that's like also every time I put out a video, I'm like, nobody's going to watch this. Yeah. Like every time. Like, I don't know. And then when people watch it, I'm like, why are you people watching this? Like, <laughs> don't you have anything better to do? I'm yeah. boring. <laughs> like, like, aren't you bored of me yet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I do more. I like, I'm sick of hearing myself talk. You've got to be tired of me by now. <laughs> I, I get that a lot because I say to people like I could really use some feedback especially sometimes like with brain fog and stuff I've got the irony is I've got a list of ideas I'm sure you have as well mm -hmm. of all the things I can do but sometimes someone asking me something sparks a different kind of inspiration mm -hmm. than my list that I've had sitting there for ages and I'm like come mm -hmm. on people ask me because I will serve it to you and people like right. I love everything you do and I'm like <laughs> yeah I mean, it's like, really nice. I appreciate it, but yeah. <laughs> please, please let me know what your favorite things are. Yeah. So yeah, as soon as someone, yeah. I think about three people once recently said to me, because I've got the now the animal and tarot series on Patreon. Mm -hmm. And suddenly people started showing a lot of interest in it. And I'm like, awesome, we're doing it then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's now a thing. That's great. Yeah, it's now a thing. Yeah. I did that with my member content too. Cause I was like, I don't know what y'all want to see. And they're like, whatever. No, that doesn't help me. So I did this thing. I'm like, okay, y'all give me ideas. And every, not, not quite every week. Cause I have a few other types of videos, but I roll dice to see which one I'm going to do. And then that's the one I do. I love that. That's and it just like, you can gamify anything. Like my whole yeah. deal is just gamifying my life. That's all I'm trying to do. <laughs> just trying to gamify everything. You're, you're a living inspiration. I'm going to start doing that. Like these are the things that I need to get done this week. What one am I going to do today? Right? Just roll, just roll a dice. Like we were doing that with our WTF that's coming out um, this week. We Because we use dice in that anyway. But then we're like, Lisa was like, oh, we could roll dice to decide what question we're going to ask, right? So like any time we get the opportunity to roll dice, because the other thing about it is it kind of takes away decision paralysis. Yeah. Which I suffer from a lot, especially if I've got a big list. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. Like, yeah, so dice. Too much good information. It's, like, it's well, too much good information. Ideas, but mm -hmm. I've got to pick one. I got to pick one. Yeah. So I love the, like with my, my member content, I just, I roll the dice and that's the, sometimes I'm so unprepared for what comes up though. And I'm like, okay, now I got to figure out how to do this video. And it's all happens at the same time. So yeah. I don't get to prepare for it. It's like, okay, I rolled the dice. Now we're going, but it does take away that. I don't know what to do out of yeah. all of these videos, or I don't know, like, 
what y'all want to hear or anything. And, and most content creators are like, they're happy to oblige. If you have suggestions and then as long as it's within their comfort zone. Yeah. Most of us are like, please give us an idea. <laughs> yeah. Like we love it. And like I always say to people, it's not, we don't have them. It's just, it's nice to like mm-hmm. engage with people who have said something specific. It's inspiring. Mm-hmm. It creates conversation. People then engage mm-hmm. back. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. Good stuff. Do it, people. <laughs> Do it. Yes. Let us all know what you want to see. Yeah. We will. We will oblige most of the time. So. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. This was such an awesome conversation. I'm it so was- glad we finally got to like connect. <laughs> so fun. I'm always really nervous when I start off, but that's more just a being on camera thing than anything else but uh yeah I've been I've actually been very excited about it and I I kept going to my partner like remember I'm busy Wednesday evening (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's awesome yeah I'm doing the thing I love that that's amazing we should totally do it again totally do it again yes because I feel like I have I have many more questions for you I could pick your brain (laughs) for hours so but oh the same same yeah (laughs) yeah thank you for inviting me on to hang out as yeah well. it's um it's nice like it has more of a community feel I'm loving mm-hmm. that that's why I'm loving your WTF series as well like mm-hmm. I I don't know if I've commented yet and I think again it's that thing like I want to try and get better at that myself being mm-hmm. forgetful because I've watched it in bits mm-hmm. and it but like having you girls in the background when I'm like on my own and there's nothing going on in Mm -hmm. the house is nourishing and sanity saving and fun Mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's so good I'm loving it so yeah it's so much fun join in kind of thing. yeah thanks for coming it was great um I'm gonna leave links for all your stuff in the description box below all the things so like y'all if you if you're not following Tegan first of all what's wrong with you second of all (laughs) go fix that right now (laughs) 